All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the four-way speech contest sponsored by the uh, Rotary Club of Merrimack and located at the Merrimack High School in Merrimack, New Hampshire. I'm Mike Hoover. Uh, it's a privilege to MC part of this evening. I'm going to split my duties with Maureen Mooney. She is one of the past presidents of this club. Um, I'd like to introduce you to the uh, President-elect is going to be taking over this spot next year, but he's at another function representing our Rotary Club also with the uh, Boy Scouts this evening. The four-way speech contest originated in the late 1990s by the Rotary Club and is a way for students in our community to enhance written and speaking skills. Each presentation is centered around the tenets of being a Rotarian called the four-way test, which are recited before each meeting. So at this point in time, I'd like to have you all rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you would remain standing, please. Recite the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Is it true? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build good and better friendships? And will be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. So we have two clubs here tonight. We have the Merrimack Rotary Club, and we also have the Hollis Brookline Club. So this evening we have, uh, from the Merrimack Rotary Club, we have Troy Arth Arthun. He is going to be the timer. We have uh, Steve Shear, who's going to be one of the uh, scorers. We have March Chaffrey, who's going to tally up all the scores. We have Bob Freed. We have Ed Hilson and uh, Joe, who's going to be doing the ta uh, tallying. So from the House Brookline Club, uh, we have five judges who are going to be doing the initial scoring uh, of your uh, speeches. For more information on our club or Rotary International, you can go to www.merrimackrotary, that's all one word, .com, and www.rotary.org. According to the Rotary rules of the contest, the contestant speech must be original in content and apply the Rotary four-way test in everyday relationships with other people. The speech must be given from memory and should not be read through adequate notes, although adequate notes are acceptable. And the speech shall be no less than five minutes, nor more than seven minutes in length, or it is automatically disqualified. Are the contestants ready? Let's see. Imagine sitting in a classroom, unable to focus on what you're doing because you're so hungry. Now I'm not talking about the hunger that you and I feel as the clock ticks closer to lunchtime. I'm talking about a maddening starvation that refuses to be ignored. You try to do your work and ignore the loud growling coming from your stomach, but your mind trails off, wondering if you even have another meal or when it could possibly be. You get home and hope your parents brought home some food to share but it breaks your heart knowing how hard they work every single day to provide for both you and your siblings. You look in the mirror at your malnourished body and see all the ribs, but it doesn't bother you because that's all you've seen for as long as you can remember. This is the life of a child suffering from hunger and starvation, and this is the life that my little cousins in the Philippines are forced to live every single day. This problem, however, doesn't only exist in the Philippines. Hunger is an unsolved problem that can be found around the globe, and it affects women and children the hardest. World hunger has been a problem since the beginning of time, and today there are still 821 million people who suffer from hunger every single day. This is why I believe that two strong solutions to end this problem are gender equality for women and educating children on nutrition and why they should not waste food. The truth of the matter is that gender equality will open up employment opportunities and encourage women farmers. 
Developing countries that have a patriarchal society, where women have little to no rights, have the greatest amount of people who are hungry and undernourished. According to the Borgen Project, 60% of the world's hunger population is female. Undernourished women who become mothers give birth to malnourished children, which is why the leading death in children that live in developing countries is malnourishment and starvation. Malnourishment is a lack of nutrition, which is caused by not eating at all or not eating the amount of nutritional foods that your body requires. UNICEF, also known as the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, states that approximately 3.1 million children die of hunger each year. This means that one child dies of hunger every five seconds. Teaching children the importance of nutrition is beneficial to all concerned because the kids who learned nutritional value when they were younger may one day grow up to have their own families. According to the World Bank, 50.5 million children around the world under the age of five had a low height and weight for their age. This is directly caused by malnourishment, which could have been minimized if the parents had received proper education on nutrition when they were younger. They could have bought food if they could have afforded it, but if they were unable to purchase the food in store, these countries also have a strong dependency on agriculture. According to the Food Aid Foundation, the number of hungry people in the world could be reduced to 150 million if women farmers were given the same amount of resources as men. This is why I believe that women farmers should be empowered and not overlooked just because it's a job for men. Solving world hunger can also build goodwill and better friendships because a healthy family is a happy family. The Borgen Project states that 161 million children have stunted growth due to malnutrition. I noticed this issue when I was 13 standing next to my cousin, Gia, who is the same age as me, thinking she was only seven years old because of how young she looked due to the malnourishment stunting her growth. I was confused as to how I looked years older than her even though we were only months apart. She had one of the happiest personalities that I had ever encountered despite her stunted growth due to the lack of food. But my mom would later tell me that she worries about my family because of their undernourished bodies and poor health decisions. If World Hunger were no longer to exist, my family, along with thousands of others, could live happily without the fear of their children or, young or loved ones dying of hunger. Solving this issue is beneficial to everyone, no matter their age, nationality, or gender. Although hunger is a bigger problem in the developing countries, it still exists in developing countries like America or the United Kingdom. According to Feeding America, 40 million people in the United States suffer from hunger, while the Board Project states that 8.4 million citizens in the United Kingdom suffer from hunger as well. If they learned how important food is and why it shouldn't be wasted, excess food could be used to feed the hungry or reused for animal feed rather than thrown out. This is an international problem. Therefore, it will benefit everyone globally. Ultimately, it will take years to end world hunger, and it is not something that can be solved overnight. I believe that countries with the greatest amount of hungry people should spend time educating their children and empowering women, which could lead to a drastic decrease in hungry people. Other countries could also reach out to those who need it more by helping to educate students on nutrition and helping women farmers. I hope that people raise more awareness for this issue so more are inspired to help those in need in order to make the world a better place for everyone. Thank you for your time. Well, we, while the judges tell you their scores, we'll take this opportunity to tell you about the Merrimack Rotary Club. The Rotary Club meets each week on Thursday mornings at 7.15, so if you're an early riser, please come and join us. Each Rotarian takes turn hosting the meeting, which consists of a breakfast buffet, fellowship, a brief meeting, and a guest speaker. Meetings end promptly at 8.30 a.m. Guests have included members of our community and business owners. We always welcome visitors and new members. How, how's the, uh, how are we doing? Now 
let's meet our next contestant, contestant number two. Hello, thank you everyone. I'm a senior at Merrimack High School, and I want to thank you all for your time. As I get closer to the school restroom, it becomes imminent. I can smell the minty odor from just outside the door. As I walk in, I see it. It plagues our teenage society today, and is one of the biggest issues in high school today. It's prevalent in school, with the administration trying to crack down, but it still occurs. I see it at work, at school, and even out in public. The problem is teen drooling or vaping, where there should be much stronger national restrictions against it. Stronger restrictions against teen vaping on a national level is definitely a very smart option. Possibly raising the age by nicotine and tobacco products from 18 to 21 will be an answer to this epidemic. I think this is going to be the health problem of the decade, said Milagros Vescones Gotsky, a substance abuse counselor in Arlington, Texas, who has worked with teens for over 17 years. Gotsky said that three to four students a week get caught vaping on campus. The fact that teen drooling is spreading rapidly and is growing out of control is the truth. According to CaliforniaHealthline.org, in 2016, California raised their minimum age to purchase tobacco products or nicotine products from 18 to 21. The data shows that the percentage of retailers selling these products to underage kids dropped from 10.3% to 5.7%. It is the truth that there should be stronger restrictions against teen vaping. Jewel spokeswoman Christine Castro also said, this product is solely for adult smokers. We absolutely condemn kids from using our products. Jewel is also putting much stronger restrictions, like being 21 to browse their website and creating a profile with photo ID to make a purchase. But teens are still the top users. Stronger restrictions will be fair to all concerned because vapes are made for adults, not teens. According to a study in the Journal of Physiology, Four researchers found that regular exposure to nicotine can cause persistent alterations in neurological fun functioning and cognitive signaling in the adolescent brain. Also, according to the Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the frontal cortex, the area responsible for reasoning and thinking before we act, develops after age 25. But these 16-year-olds are still using these products. Stronger restrictions are fair because these teens aren't fully prepared to make these decisions by themselves yet. Raising the age would allow their brains to develop and make the choice to vape when their front, frontal cortex is fully functional. The CDC also reported that uh, 480,000 de 480, deaths are caused per year from cigarette smoking. And if cigarette smoking stays the same rate, then 5.6 million adolescents under 18 will die pre prematurely from a smoking-related illness. Why is this related? Because the nicotine in vapes causes teens to get addicted to other things, such as cigarettes. If stronger restrictions were imposed on teen drooling, such as raising the minimum age to 21, then many of these problems can be solved and goodwill can be established. The nicotine in vapes is also highly toxic to the human body. When excess amounts of nicotine are consumed into the body, it impairs development in the human brain and the human lungs. These possible health issues are not beneficial to all concerned, which is why there should be stronger national restrictions. According to a study done by the National Center for Health Research, non-smoking people were four times more likely to start smoking cigarettes after only 18 months of drooling. Only 18 months. The more smokers in our community is less beneficial to society, as stated by the 580,000 people per year dying from smoking. Besides for all the diseases and illnesses caused by smoking, secondhand smoking harms many people as well. Stronger restrictions on teens purchasing vapes will be beneficial to everyone concerned because there will be less smokers throughout the United States, which is definitely a positive. The FDA has also started with some restrictions nationwide as they have not allowed gas stations to sell fruit favored jewel pods. And this is a first step in the right direction. With this epidemic becoming such a big concern, it is time for us as citizens to take action. We must make alterations to the law to prevent young adolescents from obtaining these damaging vapes. We must make sure that these adolescents truly have the ability to make wise choices. We must impose restrictions to protect these kids, along with the future of our society. These previous studies have showed why jewels are very harmful and could impact our society in a negative way. 
This is why stronger restrictions should be implemented on teen vaping at a national level. These vapes are not good for society and they are definitely not fair to all concerned. I want to thank you all for your time. <laughs> Merrimack Rotary prides itself in contributing to the community through various fundraisers that take place during the year. On the 4th of July, we have a pancake breakfast. Also on this, that same day, we have a family fun day, which consists of vendors, bouncy houses, contests, and crafts. On Thanksgiving Day, we host the Turkey Trot 5K, and during the month of December, the club sells Christmas trees. Each of these events raises funds for our Merrimack community. Contestant number three. all women 
women should be able to do. More programs like this should be available to women everywhere, so they are able to get the same exposure to engineering as men do at a young age. Doing this will level the playing field for everybody entering this profession, and it will build more goodwill and better friendships with all people. Including women in engineering will be beneficial for everybody, because women will be able to confidently pursue what they love, and men and co-workers will realize that women are an integral part of a working team. National Geographic claims that as more women get involved in the sciences and diversify the group, the general knowledge in that field tends to expand. Scott Page, a professor at the University of Michigan, supports this statement by saying that as more women and different social identities get involved in engineering, there is more creativity, more insight, and more innovation. Including women in engineering and keeping them in that profession will be beneficial to everybody as more discoveries will be able to be made. In recent years, we have been seeing some improvements regarding the inclusion of women in technology. One of the highest ranking STEM schools, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, has a gender ratio of 55% male, 45% female. And female enrollment in computer science and engineering courses has nearly tripled since 2011, going from 88 to 258 women. Also, Duolingo, a language learning platform, has reached a 50-50 gender ratio in their business by recruiting engineers from schools that also have a good ratio. It took some time for Duolingo to become successful after their launch in 2011, but as their company became more diverse, their success grew which suggests that women were a large part in their improvements and accomplishments. It is time that more businesses strive to become more diverse and inclusive because it will lead to more innovation, more goodwill, and more harmony. It is time that society changes this idea that women cannot be engineers and becomes fully supportive of every person pursuing what they love. Next year, when I go to college to become an engineer, I am going to try as hard as I can and not let anybody stop me. And I can only encourage every other woman to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening everyone. My name is Maureen Mooney, a past president of the Merrimack Rotary Club and now an assistant district governor in this Rotary District 7870. It includes six clubs in this area, including Merrimack, Bedford, Nashua West, Nashua, Sohegan Valley, and Hudson Litchfield. Now funds earned through annual fundraisers at the Merrimack Rotary Club are given directly back to the Merrimack community. One way this is done is through the club funding four generous scholarships for Merrimack High School graduates. The scholarships are the Applied Technology Scholarship, Arts Scholarship, Community Service Scholarship, and the President's Award. These Rotary Scholarships assist residents with much needed tuition assistance. And at this point, I believe we're ready for contestant number four. Take a moment and try to picture an eight-year-old boy. An eight-year-old boy whose parents have been divorced for three years now, so every other weekend at his dad's house was normal to him. However, this visit was everything but normal. This eight-year-old boy was packed in the back seat of his father's Jeep with his brother next to him and his, father, his sister in the front seat. Shortly after getting on the highway, this eight-year-old boy's father was pulled over because of a crack in his windshield. The officer comes up, takes his license and registration, and goes back to the cruiser. Almost immediately, he comes back to the car and asks the eight-year-old boy's father to step out of the vehicle. Within the blink of an eye, he was cuffed and put in the back of a cruiser. The eight-year-old boy later found out that his father had been driving with a suspended license due to two prior DUI arrests. This is something that would scar anyone for a lifetime. That eight-year-old boy was me. My father, an alcoholic, made the choices that led to what would have been rock bottom for many. However, his drinking was no surprise to me. Whenever I was at his house, my siblings and I would almost make a game of counting how many beers he'd have a night. Typically, it was around seven or eight. 
The sad part is, my father wasn't even recognizing that he was developing a dependency on alcohol and pushing his children further and further away. To help this problem, we must force those that have this dependency to recognize that they have a problem. Once alcoholics accept that they have a problem, they then can open up to the help they need, whether that is through guidance and support from their family or through rehabilitation facilities. If their drinking results in criminal acts, higher actions must be taken against them. The truth is, my father isn't the only one dealing with this problem. In, in fact, according to the Washington Post, one in every adult Americans is an alcoholic. Three-fourths of these people think nothing of their drinking habits. They don't even realize that they have a problem. Unfortunately, this number is on the rise. People all around us struggle with a dependency on alcohol, and for many, you would never even know. We must recognize these people and offer them the help that they would not otherwise seek. In a recent Talbot Recovery Center study, they found that more than 15 million people struggle with an alcohol use disorder in the United States, but less than 8% of those receive treatment. Why? Because many of these adults are too stubborn or too ashamed to admit that they need help. This is fair because many of these alcoholics not only hurt themselves, but their families. And they can also put other lives at risk as well. According to the Bureau of Transportation, every two hours, three people are killed in an alcoholic-related crash. A large amount of these crashes is credited to habitual drinkers. Think about that. In one six-hour school day, nine people are dead because someone else made a dumb choice. Nine families torn apart so suddenly because of someone else. My siblings and I could have been a part of that statistic. On top of these crashes, there are on average 4,000 arrests made per day for driving under, under the influence. These offenders, like my father, are typically released on bail days later. How does this make any sense? They put their own lives and the lives of anyone else on the road at risk, and only, their only punishment is a night in jail. Sounds like they just go home and have a drink. If we can decrease the number of alcoholics in the world, they can become better members of society and build goodwill and better friendships. Many alcoholics start binge drinking to try to drown away some sort of pain or sorrow. Additionally, a recent Stanford study showed that children of addicts are five times more likely to have addictive tendencies. The biggest side effect of consistent drinking in men is a raging anger towards those around them, usually being their family. Kids, spouses, and other family members getting abused day in and day out when they did absolutely nothing wrong. They are fearful of their own flesh and blood when they stumble through the door, and many times that they feel like there is nothing they can do. They give up hope. One single conversation could be all it takes. A safer and less alcoholic world is beneficial to all. Now, banning alcohol is irrational and unrealistic. Our country already tried that once, and history shows it did not work. But stronger regulations at bars and liquor stores and higher punishments for criminal acts related to alcohol can scare people just enough to not get behind the wheel of a car or maybe even combat the amount of alcoholic dependencies in the country. Less people will be at the risk on the roads every day. Families are safer and won't have to fear daily abuse and neglect. And people can learn to cope with their problems in a much healthier way. Alcohol, if drank in moder moderation, is a typical human activity. When that drinking becomes excessive, it becomes a harm to themselves and others around them. Hiding behind the bottle is not the truth. Killing people because of your idiotic choices is not fair to all concerned. Abusing your innocent families does not build goodwill or better friendships. And overall, alcoholic dependency is not beneficial to all. If we can help people, like my father, to put the bottle down or stop after one, maybe two, then in our time we can see a drastic drop in all the statistics that I have stated. I can never forget what I experienced that day with my father, but I can learn to help him. If you know someone who is an alcoholic, just ask if they need help. The first outreach may be all that they need. Thank you for your time. It's great that we have this time while the judge is telling the scores to again just inform everyone what it is and the great things that happen with the Merrimack Rotary Club. There are food pantries right here in Merrimack, and each are busy serving those in need. There's St. John Newman and St. James Methodist Church. Each month, on the first Thursday of the month, the club takes up a collection, which is matched by the club for the pantries, as well as for Meals on Wheels, that serves our elderly and homebound right here in our community in Merrimack. Additionally, some proceeds from the Turkey Trot, which is the 5K that we host every Thanksgiving morning, are contributed equally to those pantries. Where there is a need in Merrimack, you'll find typically Rotary is
is there to help out. And now we're ready for contestant number five. Hello, Mayor McRodery. Thank you all for your time. Imagine, right now, your body temperature rose to 99.9 degrees Fahrenheit. That's an increase of 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit, normal, the normal it should be. You could be feeling weak, sleepy, and confused. Today, we hear about many serious problems, but one of the more pressing issues that we hear about is climate change, formerly referred to as global warming. Not a day goes by where climate change is on a topic in the news and is now being seen as a big topic in political elections. With the rise in temperatures worldwide, the truth is we are seeing climate changes today on a micro and macro level. Locally, there are small changes with colder winters and hotter summers. They may currently be minor effects in our community, but this is not true for all areas of the world. To see the major effects of climate change, we have to go to our oceans. In our oceans, our coral reefs are bleaching four to five times as frequently as they did in the 1980s. The ocean is currently facing climate change because of human actions. According to the EPA, from 1901 to 2015, the average temperature of the oceans has risen by 0.13 degrees Fahrenheit for every 10 years. This doesn't sound like much, but that accounts to an increase of 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit in ocean temperature since 1901. These effects of climate change will eventually hit people, and to stop it, we all simply have to look at what we're doing to our climate as individuals and an entire unit. It has been recognized by the scientific community that the main cause of climate change is releasing of CO2 by humans. The United States is the second largest producer in CO2, only behind one country, China. With the knowledge that our country could be causing many serious problems, I know that we need to change. So, the first thing to look at, what is releasing the most CO2? Well, according to the NRDC, in the United States, the burning of fossil fuels to make electricity is the largest source of heat trapping pollution, producing about 2 billion tons of CO2 every year. With such a large amount of CO2 being released by humans just for electricity, we need to simply make a switch to more cleaner, more efficient way of energy. Currently, in New Hampshire, we have a law that by 2025, 25% of energy sold in New Hampshire must be renewable energy. But I believe that we need to implement an addition to this law, that as every five year goes by, the amount of renewable energy sold must go up by 5% as well. This is fair to all concerned, because we'll, we'll, we'll all have to face these effects of climate change. Renewable energy may seem like a small thing, but it'll have a huge effect in stopping climate changing, or at least minimizing it. This small little switch could account for saving many of our Earth's natural habitats that we all love. There are many forms of renewable energy that we could all switch to, including solar, wind power, and hydroelectric energy. There are many more, and, more, and there are many that are very cost effective. Switching to these renewable sources would require more work and lots of change. But it would save us from massive effects of climate change. Maybe not for us, for changes our future generations might see. With these changes that we would implement, they would build goodwill and better friendship between businesses and communities as they both be working together to preserve our environment and we see, again, our businesses working with the community in a great way. This is fair to all concerned, because we all face these changes in climate change. Whether we like to admit it or not, our climate is changing. And we will keep on seeing these changes until we, keep on make, until we change something. 
I believe that we, even though the, the government is telling us to change, we all need to change as well. The, the Earth's temperature is rising. And I remember when I told you, imagine your body temperature to rise to 99.9 .9 degrees Fahrenheit at the beginning. You probably were wondering why you're thinking that. Well, that is what the coral reefs face during climate change. Now these changes will eventually hit us. Thank you. While at Merrimack High School, it's particularly relevant to bring up the Interact Club. The Interact Club is part of Rotary. It takes place right here at Merrimack High School. It is the high school version of Rotary with its own officers, members, and fundraisers. It runs from September through June. Interact members can attend the Rotary Youth Leadership Awards, which is a leadership development program run by the Rotary International and is coordinated by clubs around the globe. Members of Interact volunteer for the Merrimack Rotary Club's fundraisers, including, again, the Turkey Trot 5K on Thanksgiving morning, the Christmas tree sales that run through December at Watson Park, and a very special thank you to Mrs. Gott, who is the advisor, the student advisor to the Merrimack High School Interact Club. All right. Before we get on to our number six contestant, I do just want to thank again the Rotarians from the Hollis Brookline Club. Thank you all so much for coming, and we look forward to judging your contest on March 14th at the Hollis Brookline High School. Thank you very much. Contestant number six, Mr. Jeff Hall. Hello, I am a senior at Merrimack High School. Thank you for your time. According to FBI crime statistics, on average, 43 murders are committed per day in the United States. 43 families lose a loved one and are ruined each day. The men and women who are committing these murders, ruining families, are getting close to one year in time in prison. One year. One year for someone who took a life and ripped apart a family. To help deter and decrease the amount of people who commit these murders and violent crimes, the death penalty must come into play. Yes, the death penalty takes a life, but it removes a killer from society. There are plenty of different opinions out there on whether the death penalty should be allowed or not, but most, most of those opinions are from people who have, not been, who have not been affected by a murder in their family. People that are part of a family that have been affected by a murder are looking for a sign of relief and justice for their lost loved one. The death penalty will bring them that justice. Knowing that a murderer who can no longer harm another person who has and can take a life for whatever reason can bring that feeling of relief. According to ProCon.org, just in the state of California, all the prisoners on death row have murdered over a thousand people. 229 children, 49 peace officers, and 249 were either sexually assaulted or tortured. So not all criminals are murderers. They are the people who are sick-minded and will most likely commit the same crime again, but a murder is the most devastating crime. Not only just the victims and the families and friends believe the death penalty should be legal, but high-ranking government officials agree with the penalty. Alex Kaczynski, a judge in the U.S. Supreme Court of Appeals, stated, a society that is not willing to demand a life of somebody who has taken somebody else's life is simply immoral. So you tell me, is it the truth that our government should put the death penalty into effect? Criminals knowing that the death penalty is active in their state, still commit these crimes, and know that they know what they might face. Adding on to the death penalty, eliminating a murder from society, it also deters criminals from committing crimes. Allowing the death penalty to come into effect in every state could bring down murder or homicide rates all around the country. Murderers know what they might face when they pull that trigger. At Green Garage, one of the death penalty pros states, with insufficient laws to address this problem or the lack of teeth in these laws, criminals become careless and bolder to commit heinous crimes because of the leniency and punishments and loopholes in the justice system. For this reason, there is a need for the death penalty. Criminals take advantage of their state not having the death penalty because they know they can commit high-level crimes and acquire minimum punishment. It is not fair for families to know that criminals will take these risks and take an innocent life. It is fair to bring justice and relief to these families by enforcing the death penalty. 
bringing, bringing the death penalty into a state's law book can confront, confirm innocent families and make them feel free. For example, Joe Arsenaya, the man who took three innocent lives during the Boston Marathon bombing, will receive the death penalty. The families and victims will be relieved that the man who took someone from their family will never take again. This is one of the many cases where a murderer has received the death penalty. According to The Guardian, 1,264 people have received the death penalty in the United States. This statement does sound wrong, but that number needs to increase. According to Forbes, 168,000 people are serving life sentences in the United States. There are too many criminals and murderers out there with life in prison or just a couple years in jail that deserve to make a family feel comfortable again. To allow friends and communities to feel justice for their lost loved ones. To allow those families, friends, and communities to feel close again and know that there is no more threat. The death penalty will bring more than just justice and relief for those families. The New York Times posted an article on the housing of prisoners, and on average, each inmate is worth $168,000 to house an inmate. All that money to keep a murderer alive, but it could be used for education, the veterans hospital, or charities to fund the children's hospital. Criminals are taken care of by our justice system, and more money is used on them than the average American employee makes per year. That should not be the case. The case should be to eliminate murderers from our society and spend the money on something else. The death penalty benefits our state's law and courtrooms, our prisons, our society, our small town, communities, our law enforcement, and our families. Allowing the death penalty to come to effect, deterring criminals, relieving our community's families will build a healthy society. A society where murderers do not roam the streets and a society where innocent people can feel free and protected. The death penalty is not for a criminal who commits a misdemeanor. It is for ones who murder innocent people. It is for people who refuse to change and plan to do horrible things. The death penalty will bring justice to our country and allow families to feel free again. Thank you for your time. After tonight, the first place winner will give his or her speech at the 2019 district semifinals, typically in the springtime and typically in Henniker, New Hampshire. Four judges will be present, and the top four scorers at the semifinals will then advance to the district finals, which typically takes place uh, in June. Now, the rules of the contest are set forth by Rotary. The prizes are funded by the Rotary Club of Merrimack at $250 for the first place winner, $150 for the second place winner, $75 for the third place winner, and all the others are $25 awarded in terms of a check. Now, the winners will also get the opportunity to read their speeches at a regular breakfast meeting of the Merrimack Rotary Club coming up very soon. So we look forward to hosting them then. And now our last contestant, contestant number seven. Close your eyes and try to picture this. Your mom, who was once full of joy and laughter, is now depressed and is more reserved. You don't know what's wrong, but you know something's bothering her. You're constantly asking her if everything's okay, and her response is that she's fine, but you know that's a lie. You start to dig at her and ask her questions until her head falls to her hands and the tears start rolling down her face. She tells you she was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. Your heart drops and tears now start rolling down your face while you're holding her in your arms. Trying to get the words out that she'll be okay, you remember this feeling from 10 years ago when she overcame stage one breast cancer. This is what happened to someone I call my second mom, someone who is very close to me. Stage four breast cancer is the most intense stage, which means the cancer cells have already spread to other organs in the body. There are four stages of breast cancer, and stage four is the most terminal stage. According to the American Cancer Society, the five-year survival rate for people after diagnosis with stage four breast cancer is 22%. By implementing mammogram tests into yearly physicals for young teens and adults nationwide, it could um, detect early signs of cancer before it can spread or worsen. 
the Breast Cancer Coalition says that when breast cancer appears on a mammogram, it could have been in the body for up to six to 10 years. It is the truth that if cancer is found in the early stages, it is easier to treat and be fully cured. If mammogram tests are implemented into yearly physicals, it can lessen the chance of cancer cells spreading to other parts of the body if the cancer cells are in fact detected. Mammogram tests can also be fairly expensive when a patient is uninsured, costing anywhere from $100 to $400. With insurance, a test can cost anywhere from $25 to $50, which is very inexpensive. Dr. Deborah Sullivan says that all women should have regularly scheduled mammogram tests, but most forget about it because it is not in their family health history. Some families cannot even pay to for, um, afford to pay out-of-pocket costs, so it would be fair to all concerned and less expensive if mammogram tests were put into yearly checkups. This is why I believe that all these tests should be included into yearly physicals. According to the National Breast Cancer Foundation, mammograms often show breast lumps before the human can physically feel it. Doctors and nurses encourage women to perform at-home breast cancer checks to allow them to feel around for lumps that may appear. These lumps could have been in there for a long time before they were even physically there, which is why mammogram tests should be readily available. The Breast Cancer Foundation also states that every two minutes a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer and every 13 minutes one woman will die from breast cancer. Let's just think about that for a moment. From this short time that I have been presenting, two women have been diagnosed with breast cancer. From the minute you got here to the time you leave, multiple women will have died from breast cancer and even more have been diagnosed. That statistic alone has had the biggest impact on my life. According to the National Cancer Institute, some patients whose cancer is detected and treated early on may have better long-term survival rates than people whose cancer is not found until it spreads or worsens. This will build goodwill and better friendships because this solution allows families and relationships to last longer if the cancer is treated early. Also, relationships with the patients and the doctors have become a lot closer because they are now a lot more personal. Although women are more stereotyped to have breast cancer for more obvious reasons, men could receive the benefits of getting mammogram tests taken because they do not have the tissue that can interfere with the test results. Even though men have a very small chance of developing breast cancer, it is still important for men to think about the concern because it, as it is a possibility for them. According to the American Cancer Society, it is estimated that 480 men will die from a late diagnosis of breast cancer this year alone. If you just said to yourself, wow, that's a lot, then listen to this. For women, that number is 50,000. That's right, 50,000 women will die from breast cancer this year alone. So with the mammogram tests being put into yearly physicals, it would be beneficial to everyone concerned. With the help of everyone who will donate money and participate in walks for breast cancer, we can raise enough money to put mammogram tests into doctor's offices around the United States. Mammogram tests also can be very physically expensive because the machines are up to date on the modern technology, costing roughly $500,000 per machine. With the money that is raised yearly, we can start to get more and more tests into doctor's offices around the United States. As of right now, $6 billion on average is raised yearly for breast cancer research and $700 million is spent for that research. With the leftover contributions, we can spend money getting schooling and training for nurses and doctors to be able to perform these tests so men and women of all ages can have the benefits of detecting breast cancer. Today, that person that's very close to me is doing a lot better and is making her way towards a healthy recovery. It is the best feeling in the world to know that she's doing better, and I want that feeling for every friend and every family member of cancer patients. Everyone in this room and everyone across the nation can make a difference in cancer patients' lives, their families, and their communities. Thank you. All right, if everybody can reconvene, the, the tallying is all done, and the uh, winners and so forth have all been chosen. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank the members of the Hollis Brookline Club for coming and spending the evening with us. And as uh, Maureen said, we will be joining you guys in March to uh, help out with your four-way speech contest. Uh, and once again, I'd like to recognize Maureen Tracy and Maureen Mooney as helping out with actually setting this up and so forth with the assistance of March Chaffrey. So thank you very much.
So, if I can have all the contestants come up. Shana, excuse me. I'm horrible with you. Bobby? Yes. Carter? Carter? And Cole. All right, third place. Robert. Second place, Autumn. And tonight's winner is Shelby. So let's give another round of applause for our contestants this evening.